To start us off today, it is my pleasure to introduce Aruna Roy, who is a longtime friend and guide of aid. When she attended our 2002 conference in Palo Alto, she inspired us to connect the element of seva to Sankarsha Nirman that we had learned from the Narmada struggle, thus completing the formula that has been a core principle of the Association for India's development, Sankarsh Nirman Seva. Sankarsh, speak truth to power, Nirman, practice the solutions, and Seva, serve personally, live responsibly. She has been part of the Indian Administrative Service, the National Advisory Council, and received the Magsaysay Award, which honors courageous service and pragmatic idealism within a democratic society. Along with Shankar Singh, Nikhil Day, and many others, Aruna Roy founded the Mazdoor Kishan Shakti Sangatan, and she is the president of the National Federation of Indian Women. Aruna Ji, we are so honored that you could join us and talk to us about workers' rights in the time of the crisis India faces today. Okay. I'm very, very happy to be with all of you, Arvinda, and thanks for being so generous in the way you've described me. Uh, the MKSS has finished uh, celebrating 30 years of its existence on the 1st of May, and we have not been able to get together, uh, collect together on Patiaka Choda, which is a place where the MKSS was born. Uh, we've been trying to get other ways of celebrating it, and we're a huge collective these awards and things single out people, and we have always been embarrassed by these awards. So actually, every, anything that comes to any one of us individually is everybody's. So Nikhil and I share everything. It's very difficult to speak in 15 minutes about the COVID and what it's done to workers in India because it's colossal. The, we are the we are the ones who don't have who no no one wishes to see, no one wishes to listen to. So in this uh, very silent din, which is COVID's uh, uh, reaction to, uh, India's reaction to COVID, we are all boxed into our little houses and little places. Uh, it is India's reaction to COVID, and which uh, we've been talking about recently, and Usha Ramanathan spoke about it again today, that the state sees COVID, uh, and people who suffer from COVID, uh, as criminals rather than patients. We've really been people who have ventured out because of necessity, who've been migratory workers, who've been stopped from going home, who don't have any amenities to even stay. The moment they started walking home, keeping distance, putting on masks of various sorts, which they tied around their noses, were blatantly hit. They were pushed, pulled, and some of them died en route to their homes. And even today, many of them are in states where they have no access to uh, either the comfort of being with family, nor real comfort of health and health care, nor the comfort of uh, food security. So we really are looking at a people who are, as Nikhil and I wrote, seen much more as utilitarian necessity for this country. And they have lost the space, if there was any before, in humanitarian terms. So we are really looking at a people who are victims of technology, victims of, trends, of a centralized governance. We are seeing, looking at people who have lost their jobs and who do not know whether they'll get back to them. We are looking at a people who are now hungry and who are devastated by the kinds of consequences to their lives. No matter what kind of economy takes shape now, we have to insist on a few things that we know works. We all know, and uh, economists all over the world have said that the one thing that really is important for India today is employment. And the most important thing today for us is rural employment, because most of these people are going to go back to their villages. The one thing that we feel we should strongly demand is an extension of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, not to the 100 days that we are entitled to now under the Act, but to much more. I mean, all through the year. We are going to explode in terms of numbers when most people who come back to the village back again from small places where they worked, will be loath to get back. The second thing I feel that will be extremely hazardous for us is the use of technology now, because technology like this one that we are using today, though it's extremely convenient, and we've become victims of comfort and convenience, all of us, and we've now stopped looking at the implication of all this use of this technology. 
are going to be victims of this kind of technology. And what is frightening is that I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to really paraphrase all that I have to say, and I'm sure many of you know a lot of things. Uh, so I'm just going to just mention what the issues are. So technology, though it's a convenience today for the government to track us, to give us our food, to make sure that we have all what health facilities and so on, is also going to be used by them to uh, put us into all kinds of niches, control our lives. And the most staring example, the ghastly example we have today is of Arogya Setu an app which they are threatening to download into any kind of smartphone uh, by default and which is going to track us, which is going to absolutely record everything we do. And I think there's a building resistance to this kind of technology. So we are actually attacked. We know when you are fighting for health and for public health, there is no possibility of mobilizing as we used to do before. And some of you raised an interesting issue. How do you mobilize? The only thing we know how to mobilize for and with is public space. And public space is denied to us. How can you ever mobilize on internet? And it's impossible. And for India's masses, it's completely and absolutely unthinkable. So where is the freedom to get together in a space and protest? If we do manage at some point of time to get together and protest, there will be tracking of every single syllable we utter. So if we by accident say something, which can be interpreted as anti-national or anti-this government. It will be turned into a crime against the state. And within no time at all, we'll all be behind bars. So there is this threat that if you actually get to a public space and make a statement, you're not going to, not only going to lose your freedom to speak, you're going to lose perhaps your freedom to even live. So this entire scenario of manipulation has become possible because of government's use of technology to control what they call a disease, but it's not the virus that they are controlling really, they are controlling people. And it's frightening what the future of this kind of program will be. Uh, we are also quite frightened by the kind of, kind of scenario that is now emerging for the security of the worker. The worker's security used to be guaranteed by labor laws. Labor laws now have been so distorted or have ceased to exist. So you can't in many places form a union. You can't form unions to fight your case anymore with the kind of impunity that you had, that we had before of constitutional protection and of access to laws. So you don't have unionization. On the other hand, you have contractors and you have contract laws, most of which are not even entered on paper. So when we go into these contract labor, there is no future for us. If you look at the kind of labor forces that are going to be unleashed by the farm sector going to sleep because they produced, we have had a bumper wheat crop. The bumper wheat crop has produced 77 million tons of wheat alone lying in FCI go-downs. They won't distribute it for extend the ration to cover the entire village, to cover the whole population in the village or in an urban center, they won't extend the quantum of wheat. And what are they going to do with this wheat? There is no storage space. The FCI go-downs are overflowing with wheat. So there is no logic to the kind of governance that there is. If you think, or I think, that we will question the prime minister about all the various inaction or non-action that the, the government is doing today, there is really no platform. Because you cannot, for instance, in many places in this country, have the, the, the media has no access. The media can't go to places. They can't photograph. They can't publish. We can't have access to the newspapers we saw every day. It's only on, the, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a computer screen that we see the newspapers today. So what have you actually done? You have isolated not only people from the disease. You've isolated them from people's politics. You've isolated them from each other. You've isolated them to such an extent that they are going to lose the ability actually to mobilize and communicate and fight their battles. So when we are in this kind of peculiar scenario, how are we going to collectively again voice what we need to voice? The other frightening thing that which uh, many of you may also talk about is the communalization of the virus. There is a very strong belief that this virus was brought in by the Muslims, which has been perpetuated by this present government in, 
in Delhi and which has not lost an opportunity to insidiously say that this virus has come because of Islam. So today, this, this horrible, horrible kind of manipulation and conditioning has actually permeated and penetrated all, almost all of village India. So today you have villages barricading themselves, not only against the disease and people who may come infected by the disease, but they are barricading themselves against possible intervention by people who belong to a specific community. This specific community is so targeted today that not only is it denied entrance into the village, nor, nor I mean, and, and also targeted where they are in majority by various state governments. Uh, I won't mention them, but you know which they are. But they can't sell things. A, a, a person who has a pushcart in Barmer, if that pushcart fellow is selling vegetables, the first thing now people do is to ask your name. The moment you have a Muslim name, you cannot sell. You cannot be a vegetable vendor. You can't sell your tea. You can't do any of these things today because you are the spreader of the disease. People are scared that if a Muslim sells something or if you buy something from a Muslim, you will be contaminated. This is such a horrendous misuse of lies and a combination of fear and the psychosis that has entered everybody that it is really going to be a, a disaster. I think I've overstepped my time. So I'm going to end here, but I'm going to say that it's impossible to think today of a future except for hanging on to things like Employment Guarantee Act extended to 365 days or an Urban Employment Guarantee Act, please implement it in urban areas and continue to fight for our economics, which is basic. And our economists argue that uh, the fight, this whole, it will be like the New Deal in the US when everything got constructed because of an emphasis on spending and spending on employment. But otherwise, what, what else is there for us? We'll have to really watch, wait and see because we don't know what kind of economics this new world is going to bring to us. Everything that we know is, has been destroyed. So we'll have to wait to see what kind of a new global situation emerges because these global situations are now impacting national governments. And we have to see whether the government of India and the Indian state will retain its democratic pattern or not and how much of centralization and resulting from centralization a different kind of system of governance is going to emerge. With all these fears, we still fight on because I think one of the things that is wonderful about being with people in India, is that we are determined to get on top of it. But the how of it, I think we'll have to wait and see. And even if I did know how, I wouldn't share it on this platform because we, we've been hearing that Zoom itself and all these webinar and all these, all these various facilities also carry messages to wherever we don't want them to carry, and that we are also victims of all kinds of uh, espionage, mini espionage systems. And so I wouldn't share my strategy on a webinar platform. But I would certainly say at the end that despite everything else, I've just come back from Dev Dungri and I feel uh, our visiting people on the screen from Dev Dungri. Nikhil has been to Dev Dungri and has just come back because he got a permit to travel. And we hear the enthusiasm and the optimism in the voices of the very young. And I think something will turn up. Something will have to happen. And thousands and hundreds of thousands of millions of people can't be stampeded into accepting a diktat. So let's hope that the virus be contained, yes. But more than the virus, the virus of hate, the virus of, of, uh, of uh, want, the virus of not having a proper public health system, will be fought for by the indomitable Indians and the people at the grassroots as we always have. We've not lost that faith yet, so that faith will carry us on.